Okay, well, that's uh, yeah. cool after yeah. three. Hello, everybody in, in uh, virtual land. Um, we have the pleasure of a double hitter, uh, Jack Harris from, from Yale, uh, giving us his second talk. Uh, he was a Copian speaker yesterday. Um, and now he, he's going to tell us about uh, a different project of his um, in his lab. Um, Jack uh, did his uh, undergraduate work at Cornell and uh, did his graduate work with um, Dave Ashlam at UCSB for coming faculty at Yale, where he's in the Department of Physics and Biophysics. Um, he's been a pioneer of optomechanics for ages, you know, just you know, one, you know, one interesting result after another in, in the series. And so thank you for providing yeah. myself to give a second talk. That's me who invited you. But yeah, so okay, uh, if you came to the co meeting yesterday, that was one project. This is uh, something completely different, as I say, very, very different. Um, and uh, this is a project um, where we are measuring, uh, we're counting individual phonons in some sense in uh, as they enter and leave a nanogram scale body, which is kind of, uh, as it happens, a fraction of a cubic millimeter of liquid helium. So an object that you can see with your naked eye, um, except that the helium is famously difficult to actually see, but you know, it's that kind of size scale. And we're counting the phonons um, in one of its uh, normal modes of vibration. And so what I'll uh, talk to you about today is kind of why we would like to do that. What are the interesting scientific Questions, what are the interesting potential applications? And I think they're both. Um, I'll describe how it is that we're able to detect and really count uh, single phonons. The phonons themselves have energy of a micro electron, they're hundreds of megahertz, but we can get a single photon detector to go quick because of them. So, I'll explain how we leverage single photon detectors to turn them into single phonon detectors. I'll explain, which, and all of this sort of fits under the standard. Uh, set of goals of optomechanics or quantum optomechanics. Uh, but I'll tell you kind of why we're particularly intrigued with liquid helium as a material in which to do this kind of physics, both quantum optics and quantum acoustics. And then I'll tell you a bit about where we're heading. And this is my group, at least as it was about a year and a half ago. Um, this is work carried out by uh, actually research scientist Yogesh Patil and graduate student Tichi and Lucy, uh, and uh, very much enabled by our collaboration with Jacob Wright. In Paris. Okay, so uh, the real motivation that I think of for quantum optic mechanics is really around the broader question of how well does quantum mechanics describe macroscopic objects, or to what extent do you need quantum mechanics to describe any observable consequences in a macroscopic world? And I think there are maybe three different ways of thinking about this as a motivation. Um, one is just uh, it's amazing. It's completely astonishing that uh, Marcus Arms group in Vienna can take molecules that look like this and put them in an oven and have them fly through meters of vacuum tube and at the end pass through real physical slits, micro machines in a silicon nitride membrane, and then collect those molecules one at a time on a phosphorescent screen and see the interference pattern emerge. It's associated with this big, clumsy object's center of mass motion. These are the de Broglie waves of this object. And if all people ever did in this field was just keep doing that with bigger and bigger objects, you know, working harder every year, I would say this would be completely worth it and totally fascinating. In addition, though, uh, mechanical sensors are a really robust and sophisticated technology in the classical domain. They're, your cell phone is full of them. Uh, LIGO uses them. They're used for all kinds of precision instrumentation. And in general, if you can take such a technology and access its quantum behavior, usually there are ways to make that a win. There are ways to improve the performance of these devices. And lastly, it's conceivable, uh, even though kind of the default assumption is that quantum, as surprising as it might seem, the basic rules of quantum mechanics just apply to macroscopic objects. Um, it is quite conceivable that there's real fundamental surprises to be had in pursuing this uh, program of just searching for quantum mechanics in bigger and bigger objects for multiple reasons. At some point, you will have to admit that the object you have put in a superposition is so massive that it is deforming the geometry of space-time in its vicinity. And that it would be reasonable then to ask if you're putting a space-time geometry in a quantum superposition. We don't have a good theory of this yet. And there are theorists who say that 
um, even though experiments in this kind of regime, very non-relativistic, but very massive objects can still aren't going to tell you everything there is to know about quantum gravity. There are proposals that experiments measuring phenomena like this could at least uh, narrow down the, the theory space for quantum gravity. There are other possibilities too that Schrodinger's equation is just an approximation and that there would be higher order terms or something in the evolution um, that might be uh, particularly important in massive or heavy objects or maybe just complicated systems. You know, so this is all rather speculative, but interesting. Um, in the context of exploring macroscopic quantum mechanics, one thing that has become helpful to keep in mind is to have a, a pretty good working notion of what phenomena constitute quantum mechanical phenomena. And um, this, uh, I think many fields have gone through this phase. Uh, we're definitely sort of just copying the notions of uh, quantum optics and the like, but uh, they became relevant again as people were studying math, uh, mechanical oscillators and really trying to pin down how quantum mechanical these uh, seemingly classical objects were. And so I want to give you uh, a sense of the hierarchy that we think of in terms of quantumness. And you can think of this hierarchy as maybe not a perfectly well-defined mathematical axis, but a pretty well-defined series of things, assumptions about Newtonian mechanics that you have to give up in the face of certain kinds of data. That's what I would describe it. So let me start uh, with considering a harmonic oscillator, which is mostly what I'll be talking about. And let me imagine I can do the following with this. I can remove all of its energy, so I can't remove any more. And then I can measure its position. And this is, those are statements that are perfectly well posed in Newtonian mechanics. I can make all the statements. I can make all the statements in quantum mechanics. In quantum mechanics, though, according to those laws, if I go ahead and measure the position, I'll get an answer that's not just uh, the thing sitting still at the bottom of the potential level, or it might not be. And if I repeat it and re-prepare it in its lowest energy states and measure its position, I'll get a slightly different answer. And if I do that over and over again, my results will be drawn from this distribution. It's just the ground state of the function. And if I do those measurements and instead measure momentum, I will also not find the thing sitting still. I will tend to find it with certain values of momentum. And if I repeat that over and over again, constantly preparing it to what we would call the ground state and measuring its momentum, my results will be drawn from this distribution here. And this is quantum mechanics at some level. Like classically, no, you would just find it at the origin and sitting still every single time you follow this protocol. So quantum mechanics says, uh, look, actually these distributions are going to have a certain width that's going to be set by h bar. Of course, this is one of them. <clears throat> At the same time, it would be true to say that if quantum mechanics were wrong or didn't really apply to the system, I could get exactly these same results from Newtonian mechanics if this harmonic oscillator was just coupled to a thermal back. If we were just in thermal equilibrium, I would have this Gaussian distribution. And if that temperature was fine tuned, it would give me exactly this picture. So these are phenomena that you might associate with quantum mechanics, but a skeptic or someone who is being precise might say, well, that's perfectly consistent with Newtonian mechanics, just depends on what you think the system really is. Um, and yeah, uh, okay. So here's, uh, as we move up the hierarchy, suppose that I can do something a little bit more sophisticated. Suppose that what I can do is to take that exact same harmonic oscillator and prepare it in its first excited state, not its ground state, and then measure position. And then do it again, prepare it in this state and measure position. If I keep doing that, uh, my probability distribution will look like this. It's just the square of the first excited state. And if I measure this momentum after preparing it in the state, I will get something, and all those measurements will look like this. And okay, that seems maybe fine. Like, why is this any much more exotic, perfectly reasonable looking probability distributions? The reason that this is substantially more exotic or more quantum than our usual thinking of things is that if I was to say, okay, classical physicist, uh, you believe that this object has in every instant a well-defined position and momentum. This is a postulate of Newtonian mechanics, but maybe I just don't happen to know what it is, so it's going to be drawn from some random distribution in phase space. If I was to ask, well, what, prop, what function that lives in phase space in the plane defined by x and p has as its marginal distributions 
this in one direction and this in another direction. In fact, you can measure any linear combination of x and d, and it always looks like this double hump. If I was to ask what function is it that has that as marginals, it's the one drawn here. So fine, what's the problem? That that's, seems like, okay, it's not thermal equilibrium. This is clearly just a thermal equilibrium. This is some kind of exotic path that coupled to it. No, because this function, in order to reproduce these marginals, has to go negative. So whatever that function is, is mathematically well defined, it is not the probability, the a priori probability of finding this object with a certain x and a certain d. There is no function that can reproduce this. Okay, so that's the sense in which a, a harmonic oscillator in this state is more quantum. There's like, I have to, I have to admit that more classical mechanics is wrong to explain data. Uh, I mean, any questions? I'm definitely happy to be interrupted. Um, so I, when I was learning about the harmonic oscillator and its energy levels, and it was, you know, a certain kind of exercise, I really wish someone had told me that the first excited state is so much cooler. <laughs> okay, then there's still this hierarchy goes on and on. There are different ways to chop it up. But here's another step, which is suppose I have two of these things, and I prepare it in what's called the Bell state, which you could think of as there's one quantum of energy in this system, but I don't know whether it's an object A or an object B. There's a similar story that I can tell that I'm not going to walk you through. It involves measurements of this object, measurements of this object, and those measurement outcomes will get perfectly reasonable looking things. Sometimes it will be plus one, sometimes it will be minus one. But if I ask what would the joint property of the system have, have to be in order to explain those as marginals, it would have to be something very weird. And here is it's sort of the same notion here, but the weirdness here is extended, isn't just a property of one object. It's somehow a property of a system that is extended over space. Okay. And uh, anyway, so this is, and this would be kind of more interesting quantum physics. I'd have to get uh, specifically what's usually referred to as local realism. Um, and that's uh, just sort of more exciting. One's ability to do these measurements certainly hinge on what kind of system you're working with and what kind of states you can prepare. If you can prepare them. One energy, uh, one excitation energy eigenstate. There's a bit of this interesting physics. But it also hinges on what kind of measurements you actually have available to you. So in this story, I was telling a story in which I could make an infinitely precise measurement of position sometimes, and an infinitely precise measurement of momentum other times. That's sort of this cartoon of the strong projected measurement. Quite often, if you have like a big heavy thing like a LIGO mirror and you're trying to measure its position. Really, what you're doing is you're bouncing a laser beam off of it and collecting that laser light for a certain amount of time, and from that, it's inferring the object's position. And if you do that, it turns out that the quantum fluctuations and the like, and there are different ways of thinking about it, will always obscure this incredibly cool stuff. That photo current record will not have evidence of this directly. On the other hand, if you take that exact same light and put it on a single photon detector, something that really goes to click every time it thinks it's absorbed a photon. Then it turns out there are ways to uh, take this data such that you can reconstruct these kinds of features. And so in the experiments that I'm going to be telling you about today, uh, they're experiments that live in this regime uh, to which we can apply this kind of detection, and we're trying to use this kind of detection to get into this regime, basically to make this kind of state, and then we think has a uh, feasibility of getting extended into this one. So that's kind of the rough uh, idea and the kind of uh, System. So by mostly uh, limits us to Gaussian. Your your mostly refers to heterodyne measurements because you know if you're looking at a plus a dagger. Yes. You mean like in a homodyne? Homodyne and heterodyne. Yeah, right. So this would be homodyne and heterodyne measurements. So you're saying that, you know, I can imagine that you can get on Gaussian. Right, so you can do homographic reconstruction of the bigger function. Is that what you're thinking of? Or you can measure a trajectory and then you have a trajectory correlation. You can look at a quantum diffusion equation. Yeah, okay, so you would have a very reasonable looking record, and you could say, look, this violates a certain kind of inequality that I could use as a witness for bigger function negativity or something. Yeah, you can use that, uh, use correlations of that to reconstruct like uh, P or Q or mm -hmm. Yep, right. So there are definitely ways to take data and then back this out of it. 
but it will just be a lot less, it'll be more indirect. You'll be subtracting off noises, you'll be making assumptions about certain other kinds of fluctuations. Uh, you can use shot noise a um, Oh, yeah, that's fine. But the shot noise uh, record puts this sort of adds the Gaussian, you know, all this with Gaussians. And I, uh, it's been a while since I thought about this, but I uh, think you, there are certain kinds of like deconvolutions or subtractions that you would have to do back up. No? Okay, we can talk about that. Right. Um, okay, so we're interested in some the motion of some sort of macroscopic harmonic oscillator. Um, it's not quite that we can see it and see its quantum fluctuations. Um, a much more practical approach is to take uh, light, whose quantum state we can prepare relatively well, uh, engineer a situation in which that light has a unitary interaction with the, con with the quantity we're actually interested in, and then eventually leaves this cavity and comes over to a place where we can measure the light. We're always preparing the light and measuring the light, and from that record, trying to infer something interesting or something boring about the motion of the macroscopic object that it interacts with. And if you arrange a cavity like this, where the uh, object here's motion is detuning the cavity, this is what's called a, well, at least a very standard optical mechanical system. It has a nice Hamiltonian, but really the story is just that as this thing moves back and forth, it's detuning the cavity, and you collect the light that comes out of the cavity and try to infer from that record something about its motion. And there are various dimensionful scales that we can combine into dimensionless scales. These all have pretty close analogies in the atom cavity QED world. There's notions of strong coupling and the like. But I'll just tell you that in practice, the kind of true strong coupling you can get in atom cavity systems just has not been achieved. There's no system in which the zero point motion of this object detunes this cavity by more than a light. It's always, there's a tiny, tiny bit of zero point motion. You bounce a gazillion photons off this cavity, and from that uh, you know, cumulative record, maybe you learn something about this message. So that's too bad, because we would obviously like to do all the wonderful atom cavity. Uh, but there's a trick that we learned from the uh, quantum optics world, which gets us relatively close without having to be in true strong coupling. Um, and this is to make use of uh, the nonlinearity of strong projective measurements which, as I said, we don't have for mechanical systems, but we do have strong projective measurements for protons. So again, imagine I have a situation in which I have a, an optical cavity and I send in some green laser light. Every photon that comes out will be green. But if this end mirror is actually a harmonic oscillator that can wiggle back and forth, it is possible for the light to come in and come out on the blue shifted sideband or the red shifted sideband. And classically, this is not particularly mysterious. This thing is oscillating back and forth. It's just phase modulating and these are the FF assignments. But if I put a single photon detector there, it's reasonable to ask when this thing goes click, it saw exactly one photon come out. Did it see a green photon or did it see a blue one? Because if it saw a blue photon, if that click was a blue photon, you know that contingent upon that click, one phonon of energy was extracted from this oscillator. As somehow I've only been sending in green photons, and one of them got a little bit of extra energy that came from this guy's motion. Likewise, if I get a red shifted photon that went click, that means that green photons were coming in and added exactly one photon to this mechanical oscillator. So if you have a detector that really goes click and let's say tells you whether it was a blue one or a red one or not, then you can use that information um, to learn something pretty serious about this. Uh, mechanical oscillator's quantum state, like I just added exactly one photon to it. The problem is that because of the weakness of this coupling, for every uh, sideband photon you get out, there will probably be about 100 million unshifted photons just swamping your detector. So you get all these clicks. Also, most of these detectors don't really tell you what the wavelength is. They just have sort of a broad range of wavelengths that they detect. And so again, the trick that we learned from the quantum optics community is just the following, just build a really good filter here. A filter that's so narrow that it only passes one of these beams. In this case, it's the red one. And in that case, every time this goes click, the back action of that measurement would be to add exactly one photon to this mechanical oscillator. And this is a plausible way of preparing such a system in that interesting quantum mechanical state, the state that has exactly one photon. So this is the kind of scheme that we would like to employ.
Um, before I tell you about how to do that, let me tell you about the, uh, the mechanical oscillator itself. And here, um, this is where our collaboration with Jacob Reichel comes in. We found it very nice to build high finesse optical cavities on the end face of the single node fibers. So Jacob has this amazing technique where you can take an SMF28 fiber or whatever fiber you want, chop off the end, shoot it once with a CO2 laser and make a nice little concavity, which turns out to be insanely smooth. The coding companies will then code it with a high finesse mirror for you. And if you take two of them and align them in glass spherules and point them at each other, this curvature and the coding will give you a nice stable optical cavity in there. And the thing that we really like about this, doing these experiments in cryostats, is that this optical mode is pretty well coupled to the traveling wave inside of the fiber. So suddenly you have a high finesse optical cavity with no input optics, no mirror mounts, no mode matching, no nothing. It was all just done by gluing these fibers in place. And you can run those fibers out of the dilution refrigerator, and it's all sort of much nicer than most cryogenics. On the other hand, it's just an empty cavity, which is a pretty boring object. Uh, so to get a mechanical degree of freedom, we simply immerse the thing in a can of liquid helium. And the liquid helium is a liquid that fills up the space, and so it's this blue stuff here. Um, and then what we're interested in is the fact that so the degrees of freedom are going to be the helium moving around, trying to slosh around. And if you have a fluid confined by walls, it has standing waves of density, standing waves of sound, like the air inside this room. And uh, one sort of elegant thing is that mirrors like these that are good mirrors for light are usually pretty good mirrors for sound. And so the normal modes of the liquid helium's motion are just waves uh, that like to live in the same uh, cavity modes as the light waves. In fact, it's exactly the same. So I should mention this off the bat, like if you think superfluid helium is an exotic material, it is in some respects. But as far as sound goes, it's just like air. It's a linear homogeneous medium. Um, and so when I solve a wave equation for the acoustic waves in here, it's the exact same wave equation that I solve for the optical. So it's the exact same family of longitudinal modes and transverse modes, the whole nine modes. And so this is going to be the acoustic degree of freedom that we're interested in, the acoustic mode that lives exactly overlap with the optical. Now you can do this with water. It would be exactly, I'd make all those same statements. But liquid helium is pretty amazing, both for quantum optics and for quantum acoustics. It has no optical absorption. It has the density of like wood within an order of magnitude. But every single atom in there is helium. Every other kind of atom just falls out of the superfluid and sticks to the wall. Um, also, if you're interested in quantum acoustics, it wouldn't be a bad idea if the acoustic modes were had low damping, so the superfluid phase helps with that. When we put these things inside of cryostats, it's always nice if the bit of the experiment you care about actually gets cold, and liquid helium has very high thermal conductivity, lots of nice things there. Um, so this is the system that we're interested in. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. You said the, the liquid helium is not very absorptive of the light. That is would be an understatement, but yes. Is it just absorptive enough to make the acoustic mode? No, so it doesn't need to absorb light to make the acoustic mode. So first of all, it's totally non-absorptive. It has a band gap, if you think of it as an insulator, which is of uh, 19 electron volts. So the 1 eV photons that we're using just can't be absorbed. And there are no mid-gap states. There are no impurities, there are no cracks, there are no defects, there are no vacancies, it's a little bit. Um, so no, the sound waves are just sound waves and the light waves are just light waves. But maybe what you're thinking about is that at this point, well, that's also pretty boring because like we want them to talk to each other. Okay, so I haven't told you yet, how, do they, how are they gonna talk to each other? Because that would make this story a lot more interesting. Okay, the way they talk to each other is the following. Um, you have this optical mode in there, I've drawn it in red, and then the sound wave involves the density of helium oscillating back and forth. And helium has a modest index of refraction, but it's a certain amount. And every time it gets 1% denser, the index of refraction goes up by 1%. So as it sound waves back and forth, its index of refraction is oscillating. That is not physically the same thing as the cavity getting longer and shorter, but optically it is. The optical length is changing. Um, so this is the nature of the problem. And there's uh, something kind of elegant that happens in this. This is really important in uh, quantum optical mechanics experiments, which is that because the light and the sound are confined by exactly the same boundary conditions, satisfy exactly the same wave equation, their normal modes all come from the same family of orthogonal functions, sine waves in this one dimensional. 
And those functions have this wonderful property that if I calculate the overlap, so like, let me consider this optical mode with two uh, standing waves in there. And let me calculate how much this sound wave detunes this optical mode. The answer is none at all, because for every place that there's some light, there's some less dense region and some more dense region and some more dense region, some less dense region, this overlap is equal to zero. And also for this sound wave, and also for that sound wave, and also for that sound wave. The only sound wave that has non-zero overlap as well in this acoustic mode is the one that has exactly the same wavelength. Actually, the acoustic mode has twice half the wavelength because this is the intensity standing wave, whereas this is the density standing wave. Uh, anyway, so that's really nice. This is true single mode coupling, uh, which Ben does not like, but sometimes you can make like this. I like it. I like it. <laughs> okay. So if you send in light at telecom wavelengths, which we do just because it's easy and wonderful to do if you're uh, free to pick any wavelength, which we are, it's going to couple the sound waves only with exactly half that wavelength, which given the speed of sound and helium is just 315 megahertz of sound waves. And this is what the devices really look like. We just use glass ferrules, we align the fibers, we have lots of tricks for getting this kind of kinematic, and then we epoxy them in place and we're done. Here's one of them. And they're simple enough that we can make a bunch of them. And then they go and live in a little can. The can goes at the end of a delicious refrigerator. And the only experimental knobs here are the fibers that come into each cavity. And then one fill line that brings the liquid. There's no piezo, there's no atto tubes, there's no microwave, there's no magnetic field bias line. That's it. This is the entire experiment. Just fiber in and out and fill the whole thing up. So I would uh, claim, and, and so this absence of in-situ alignment really simplifies things. If you know what these experiments tend to look like, this makes life a lot easier. I, in a standard dilution refrigerator, it would be no problem to put a hundred of these or even a thousand of these. And at the end of my talk, I'll tell you that I think we can make these indistinguishable um, uh, at the quantum mechanical level in a way that's useful for implementing some kinds of quantum communication protocols. Come back to it. For now, we're just going to build one and spend one of them. When you pull that down, do you lose some of the alignment? Or um, to make them no. Like symmetric? Uh, so we make it really symmetric. They're not very long. The length will definitely change, but by an amount you can kind of guess based on thermal contraction. Um, but no, kind of whatever the coding company specifies, if you do this kind of alignment, you get that finesse. And it isn't any worse when you pull it down. The whole thing is, goes from 100 microns long to 90 microns long. <clears throat> and then it's very, very stable. <laughs> There's no thermal expansion. Okay, so the experiments that I'm going to tell you about involve taking that object and driving it uh, with one laser, sending the light down into the cavity, collecting the light that comes back, which would be the unshifted light plus any phonon sidebands. We have a couple of cascaded filters that pick out just one of the sidebands and then send that light to single photon detectors that happen to live back inside the device. And we'll take some data in which we use a laser that's detuned to the blue of the cavity, such that uh, one of the phonon sidebands, well, first of all, is resonant with this main cavity here, so it can actually do this in elastic scattering, and is also uh, passed by this filter cavity, which is much narrower. And we'll do, uh, oh, okay, so here's that data. So this is the rate at which photons are counted over here at this detector as I vary the frequency of this uh, drive laser here. So if I sweep this drive laser to higher frequency or lower frequencies, the sideband photons are always traveling along with it because this is always 315 megahertz. And so as I sweep this back and forth, I see, well, there's a background, we have a certain number of dark counts in the light. There's a peak that is always there and independent of everything. And this is just uh, coming from thermal fluctuations in the fibers. But, but then there's this big peak here. And what that peak is, is when I'm, scanning the sidebands across the filter cavity. So this line width is the line width of our filter cavity, uh, about, a, about one megahertz or so. And these counts are the uh, phonon adding or phonon subtracting counts that we're interested in. And the data actually looks like this. In practice, what we do is we spend 100 milliseconds locking up all these cavities and lasers, and then for 100 milliseconds, everything is just drifting, hopefully doing what it's supposed to though, and photons are coming through and we count them. And here are the individual clicks. And if you've done photon counting, they have amazing time resolution. Here's the actual analog voltage signal coming out of the fridge. And we know what time each photon arrives within the fraction of an amp. Um, 
And this is nice if you're counting photons, but it's really nice if what you're interested in is phonons, because each one of these is the addition of exactly one subtraction of exactly one 300 megahertz sound wave in liquid helium sitting in the bottom of the solution of the trade. If we do the same measurement, but just with the laser on the red side, we get very similar data, very similar kind of backgrounds. Uh, but the phonons, uh, the sideband is of a different size. This is a well known effect, uh, sometimes called quantum sideband asymmetry, which just represents the difference in the matrix elements for raising and lowering this harmonic oscillator. But it's a nice calibration that tells us, uh, kind of, it's just sort of one more piece of information that tells us how this system is actually working. Um, so if we look at these uh, two sidebands, the sideband we get from driving on the blue and the sideband we get from driving on the red, these are Stokes and anti-Stokes, and then uh, just plot the height of those features as we vary the fridge temperature, the hotter the acoustic mode is, the more phonons there are in there, the easier it is for the scattering to happen. They both go up just as a function of temperature. But this persistent difference between the raising and lowering is a signature of, uh, well, this quantum sideband asymmetry. And uh, if you like, it, it's in that in that hierarchy of quantum mechanical effects. It's an effect that lives in the left hand side. It just has to do with uh, fluctuations of order h bar. What causes the ratio to maintain even if it levels off because so of very low temperatures? The, the ratio isn't maintained. It's always a difference. So the difference, if I have an oscillator in the nth level and I raise it, the difference between that matrix element versus the matrix element associated with lowering it is always one. And that's the origin of this side. Thing. So this is like an effect that's of order H bar, and the background is just the thermal. You can think of this as the thermal occupation, and this is sort of the zero point motion. And if it hands would be playing, that's essentially what's going on. And we can do various things as we crank up the laser power. Uh, we wish that this thing didn't get hot, but in fact, the helium doesn't absorb any light, but those end mirrors do. And we understand very well kind of what the, uh, how it heats and everything, but we're just going to take data down here where the incident laser leaves everything nice and cold. And this is data that you can absolutely take with heterodyne. You just record that uh, sideband with a local oscillator and monitor its size, and you would see exactly this data. But the data that we take has tons more information than that. It has the arrival time. The timestamp of every single photon. And there's information in those correlations. So here's a nice timestamp of a single photon. So conceptually, what we're going to do is just record all those times and then uh, list all of the delays between all of those arrivals. And I'm just going to show you a histogram of those delays. Uh, so here's a histogram of those delays. It's, uh, uh, this is also known as the G2 function, or at least the very closely related. And uh, the fit here is to the, what you would expect for a thermal source of light, a uh, light bulb, something that's emitting photons just via black body processes. Um, and it's a single exponential because of this true single mode coupling. This decay rate is exactly the uh, lifetime of the phonons. The reason I remember first like, being confused as to why I spent all this money on really nice lasers that put out coherent states. Uh, but when I count these photons, they're thermal. And the reason is that these are not the photons that the laser makes. Those are coherent, those have a G2 of one all the way across. These are the sideband photons. And they are made by taking a laser photon and adding to it a phonon. And those phonons are just there because the fridge is hot. It's not very hot, but it's, uh, that's where those thermal photons are. Okay, so that's why it looks thermal. Um, it, Turns out, since what we're doing is we're always measuring photon arrivals, A dagger A, um, when you have driven this device on the red side band and asked how phonons get converted into photons via this process, the A dagger A in your detector is the same as the phonon B dagger B. So this is really the same uh, combination of phonon raising and lowering operators. But when you drive on the blue sideband, what you're realizing is a two mode squeezing interaction between photons and photons. And so the A dagger A photocurrent is really related to the phonon B, B dagger. Um, if you're interested in the minutia of these kind of quantum statistics, this is an important difference. But if all you have access to are thermal states, it ends up not really matter. But there are more sophisticated types of measurements where this difference is 
So long story short, uh, if we measure the blue shifted photons and red shifted photons, they look thermal. Um, we have a lot of data and a lot of signal to noise ratios, so to speak. So we can look at higher order correlations and check. And just because something has a two point correlation of the thermal states doesn't mean it's really thermal. But there could be higher order collisions, higher order correlations hiding in it. So we can take this exact same data and uh, just enumerate all the triples of photons, which means you know two time intervals, two time intervals for these three, and plot the corresponding histogram of all uh, triples of counts, all two two delays. So here's delay one, here's delay two. You're more likely to see uh, photons coming together. That's one way of saying this is the bunching, and this is just a three point correlation function. And the fit again is just what you would calculate from a thermal state, so no surprises there. The data is copious enough that we can also do the four point correlation functions. Uh, so, there uh, we look at every triple of delay, so it's like a three dimensional space in which there's a scalar function. It's hard for me to plot that, so this is just a slice through one of the bases or set one of these delays to zero. But in the giant data cube, uh, this is a fit to the giant data cube. And, Again, shows what you expect for thermal fluctuations. Um, and just specifically in terms of the bunching, G2 famously has a kind of bunching factor of two. The three point correlations are even more, and the four point correlation functions are even more bunched. None of this is interesting. <laughs> like this is all just watching Brownian motion and verifying that it's Brownian, not just in it, like the cumulants of the distribution, but in the third and fourth moments. So not exciting states, not moving up the quantum hierarchy, but like a really thorough characterization of a thermal state, unusually thorough. Uh, okay, so that's it for these kinds of measures. We, uh, moving in different directions, but uh, in the meantime, um, one thing that we were interested in doing is the following. This acoustic mode that lives in here, we've just been taking what thermal equilibrium gives us. It's uh, cold enough that there's sort of on average only one or two phonons in there, but it's just a thermal state. And one thing that we were curious about is, well, that's a harmonic oscillator. Like, how hard could we drive it? Um, in quantum optics, it's very useful to have high amplitude coherent states. They're called laser beams, and they're wonderfully useful. We use them for a lot. And it just turns out that in the acoustic domain, there hasn't been as much study of that. You can make loud sounds for sure, but nobody has verified that they are pure states, just highly displaced pure states, compared to states. Um, so to check whether or not we could do that, um, and there are all kinds of metrology reasons for the same reason that it's nice to have low noise lasers, it's nice to have low noise uh, acoustic waves. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about this. There's a notion out there that such states can be used to test uh, notions of quantum gravity. I'll tell you a little bit about that later. But for the time being, we just wanted to drive this acoustic mode to a high amplitude. And if we had a nice piezoelectric element in there that operated at 300 megahertz, we would just drive it, uh, but we don't. And so what we do is we send in two laser beams into the cavity that produce a beat note, and their intensity beat note uh, serves as the driving force for this acoustic. And while we're doing that, we have a measuring laser tone that just always sits at the red sideband. And if there happen to be phonons created in this acoustic mode, maybe because of this drive, those phonons will pop photons from here onto our resonance, just as I was showing you before. And those will come through the filters and get detected. So here's what we measure. Uh, this is the rate at which photons are arriving at these detectors as we take these two uh, laser frequencies and just uh, vary their beat note frequency just by tuning them with respect to each other. And when you tune them through the 315 megahertz resonance frequency of this acoustic mode, suddenly you start seeing lots of sideband photons, photons getting transferred from here onto resonance. And so this is just a driven harmonic oscillator, but measured at least in the sort of unusual manner. Um, what we, we know that when we start, the system has about one or two thermal photons in it. And so what we were interested in is when we apply a linear drive, are we maintaining that purity? Are we just displacing it? Or is there some nasty bit of nonlinearity or parametric noise that means we're preparing a, a, a noisy state? And so you can see from the fact that the drive just gets bigger and bigger and keeps its shape. And here's the height of those Lorentzians as a function of drive. It's nice and linear. It doesn't look like anything too horrible is happening. 
but it would still be nice to know whether we're maintaining you know, shot noise limited uh, phonon number in this cavity. Do we really have a shot noise limited uh, phonon laser? And so uh, here's sort of the story that uh, I guess I should have shown a slide ago. But before we apply a drive, there's a thermal noise blob in phase space. We're wondering when we displace it, does it get any wider? And one nice way of characterizing this is repeating what we did before, which is to collect all the sideband photons and look at their two point correlations. Because as I mentioned, if what you have is a thermal state like this, the G2 of tau has this exponential decay and at zero delays has a bunching factor of two. If you have a coherent state, like a really high amplitude thing, uh, your G2 tau is just one constant. The photons arrive in a completely uncorrelated fashion. And it turns out that if you take a thermal state and just start to displace it more and more and more, this transition, of course, is gradual. You go from curves that look like this to gradually curves that look more and more like a coherent state. So this is, this is the data here. This is all stuff you can calculate. And what we noticed was that when we made the large displacement, we we're getting so many counts that we could uh, uh, plot this G2 of tau here and have a really high degree of resolution. So if you like, here's uh, amplitude. I'm guessing we've displaced this by sort of a thousand phonons on average, and it's basically coherent. It's really like a flat G2. This offset from one that's just kind of an artifact of the data. But you can see this little remnant of the thermal character. And what we've done is to take this thermal state and displace it. Um, so if we did that systematically. This is uh, applying drives that are stronger and stronger and stronger in terms of the number of phonons added, perhaps about 100,000 phonons. This is the G2 of tau that we measure. You can fit all of those. These are basically just single exponentials. And if, uh, to kind of characterize what's going on, if you just back out, like, how big is this little uh, uptick at the origin, which is to say, how big is the value here? Here, I've subtracted off one, so I can put it on the log scale. But here it is with the one restored. If you don't displace the oscillator at all, if you leave it basically undriven uh, or driven by a amount much less than one phonon, it basically looks thermal, is the situation here. And when you displace it by more than its natural width, so when you displace it by more than one phonon or so, um, that thermal character begins to be less and less evident, and it's clearly asymptoting to a coherent state. Uh, but the signal to noise ratio is very high. So let me take, sorry about that, let me take this data subtract off one and put it on a log scale. So this is that exact same data. This is the uh, G2 at the origin with one subtracted off, thermal state would be at one. And as you displace it more and more and more, it should just become more and more coherent. And what we can see is that indeed that's what it's doing, certainly out to drives of like thousands of phonons, maybe even tens of thousands of phonons, at some point, though, the size of this little uptick is so small, it's falling into our noise. And so I would say that this deviation, I would guess, is not due to any sort of systematic nastiness, but is just due to the finite signal to noise ratio of this kind of data. There's backgrounds. Um, okay, so I would take away from this the statement that we can take uh, the purity of the equilibrium state that the temperature gives to us, and we can displace it out to an amplitude of tens of thousands of photons. And there is a story, uh, like I would regard this as just, you know, potentially useful for future quantum optics, quantum acoustics experiments. But there is a story um, that has to do with quantum gravity, which is, I understand this, which is very imperfectly, is the following. Um, we suspect that maybe there's a uh, important light scale of the Planck length, um, but we would also like there to be Lorentz invariance. And it's hard to square these two properties in the field theory. There seem to be many different ways of uh, deciding what's going to end up uh, happening at the end. There are certain categories of quantum gravity in which uh, this nonlinearity, uh, sorry, in which this length scale uh, results in effective nonlinearity of, uh, uh, of quantum mechanics. And so if you sort of coarse grain over the uh, Planck scales, you end up with an effective uh, Schrodinger equation, which is slightly nonlinear. And there's uh, claims that the length scale in which this happened doesn't have to be the Planck length, which is totally inaccessible, but that depending on certain categories of functions that you're willing to admit as solutions, there should be some other length scale, which doesn't have to be this at all. 
and it's just an empirical question as to what is the length scale at which wave uh, the propagation of the Schrodinger equation um, shows nonlinearities. And from the LHC, uh, this is known to be at least 10 to the minus 19 meters because everything looks nice and uh, space time seems very well behaved, at least down to those light scales, as sort of by deep uh, electron electron inelastic scattering. And so what these authors pointed out was, well, look, if you take your average micromechanical harmonic oscillator, it has a ground state wave function that's about a femtometer, which is four orders of magnitude less sensitive than the LHC imposed limit. On the other hand, if you take that uh, uh, harmonic oscillator and you're interested in whether or not there's some nonlinearity, you should look for nonlinearities by driving to large amplitudes. The effect of a weak nonlinearity gets bigger when you don't look at the ground state, but when you look at high purity, high amplitude for ground states. And so their claim is that you win by a factor of the amplitude of the coherent state, the square root of the number of photons. And at the end of the day, they do very specific experimental protocol, which is basically just to do this. Drive your harmonic oscillator with this wave one, with the ground state wave packet like this to some large amplitude and look and see whether the, there's any signs of squeezing, it would, for example, be uh, evidence in these G2. So the fact that we don't see any tells us that this doesn't happen. We're not seeing this, at least out to here. One second, uh, at least out to here. So if I take this theory and just say, look, uh, the deviation. Uh, let me just say, okay, well, look, we do see something happening here, and I suspect this is just, you know, backgrounds in the data and artifacts of the fitting, but, like, if this were due to this uh, discrete length scale discreteness of space-time, then the length scale on which Schrodinger equation would become nonlinear would be this length scale here. So, the so basically what I'm plotting is this difference here uh, converted into that length scale. And so I would say that it's definitely not any bigger than 10 to the minus 18 meters. So a factor of 10 worse than the LHC uh, parameters, but it's still kind of fun to uh, try this out as our humble experiment. Uh, so okay, sorry. that that, will, <laughs> that effectively answers my question. I was going to say, you know, at a certain point, you need to really know what that background yeah. is. So yeah. let's do the most conservative thing, which is to say, hey, this is quantum space time, or uh, at this point, you should no longer believe anything that I tell you about quantum space time. Okay. There are many things that I don't really understand about these things. I don't know how serious. But What's the difference between the red dots and the line. Yeah. Oh, so, okay. So, uh, sorry, I meant to remove that. This line. So if I take uh, the red dots, is the red dot. This line here is the red dot plus its error bar. Yeah. So uh, if I took this super seriously, there would be certain kinds of confidence from it. So, yeah. uh, okay, so that's just kind of where we are. Uh, we have. Let me just uh, take five minutes or less just to tell you about kind of things that could be done next. So some of them are purely technical, and one of them is that these devices have an atrocious acoustic quality factor. They stink. Okay, which is a sad because liquid helium is amazing. Like you should not make an acoustic resonator out of liquid helium and then have low quality factor. It's a super fluid. Okay, the reason for that is that the sound waves are bouncing around in here, but the fancy coatings that make the light mirrors are not the right coatings to make good sound mirrors. So phonons are confined to the liquid helium only by their acoustic impedance mismatch trying to get into the glass. And that's a lot of acoustic impedance mismatch. That's effectively a 99% reflectivity, but it means that sort of the acoustic finesse can only be 100. So our, our Q is definitely limited by uh, the fact that phonons just leak into the class. And we have two approaches that we're using to solve here. One is the coding companies have actually made for us dual band DVRs that uh, are the right uh, thickness to do the optical reflectivity and then have a couple of other layers to be the right thickness to do acoustic DVRs. We think this will be very uh, big improvement in the quality factor. There's a more elegant approach that is a little bit harder to put together which is to make use of the fact that the speed of sound in liquid helium is really slow. And so basically sound is always totally internally reflected. So the speed of sound is so slow in liquid helium that in order to get into any other material, you have to come into within three degrees of normal. 
Otherwise, you're totally internally reflective. So this was like the worst geometry. This is the only geometry that would not take advantage of that. And if you just build a simple triangle cavity, the sound waves should be confined by total internal reflection. And we know from at that point their thefts would just be limited by things like the roughness of these mirrors, and we have reason to think that that would be about a three orders of magnitude improvement. The light, of course, has the opposite story in terms of speed of propagation. So it isn't confined by total internal reflection. That's what he's quoting. So we're in the process of building both of these up in our lab, and that would extend the lifetime of the phonons, given this 300 megahertz resonance, to a good fraction of a second. That would be a lot of fun. That would be very interesting to have this nanogram scale uh, object with quantum states that last for 100 milliseconds. Another thing that we're interested in is what I sort of alluded to earlier in my talk, which is that um, these devices have this wonderful property of the single mode coupling, um, which, as I told you, means that if you have an optical resonance in here that's at 1550 nanometers, the only phonons it's talking to are phonons at 775 nanometers. So that opens this possibility of taking a laser fixed wavelength like 1550 and taking our usual devices and adding one extra knob to it, which is just a nice slow PA so that could tune their length. And if you tune the length of this cavity to be resonant with this laser, and then you tune the length of this cavity to be resonant with that, and all of these cavities to be resonant with this laser, and then you drive them all through an appropriate kind of beam splitter, uh, circulators, and the like. When you get a click at this detector, you don't project uh, this system into a one phonon clock state. You say, hey, I've gotten exactly one phonon. I know that there's one phonon in the system, but I don't know which one. If they're really indistinguishable, the back end of this measurement is to drive the system to what's called a W state, the state in which that one excitation is entangled across all these different devices. And this is a very well known idea, but sort of it's been challenging to have these single photon emitters with long lived memories that are really indistinguishable that actually work at telecom wavelengths and are coupled to optical fibers. But here we have all of those things. And uh, this is precisely the kind of state that's of particular interest in turning this into uh, uh, quantum enhanced communication scheme. So the other thing that we're interested in basically is doing this um, to produce, uh, to distribute network, to distribute entanglement over an optical fiber network. Um, and that's it. So that's uh, the, just in conclusion, we have these nice superfluid optomechanical devices. We can count or maybe herald is a better word, individual phonons in them. <coughs> we've done that so far. We've been able to use that to show that the superfluid in the device is really thermal, um, that it only has maybe one or two phonons in it, and that we can add up to 40,000 coherent phonons in there. Uh, we don't see any signs of discrete space time, so be easy, everyone. Uh, and we have some ideas for how to extend this into, into interesting directions, like second scale phonon lifetimes, indistinguishable devices, and implementing this DLCZ protocol for distributing entanglements across a network and using that for efficient public communication. Uh, so, anyway, thank you for your attention. All right. We were pretty good at asking questions during the meeting. Um, do we have any other questions? Yeah. Awesome. Thanks for the excellent talk. I know you're awesome. uh, Have you thought about, like, um, could you use a, like an electron spin in liquid helium and do like cavity PD? <laughs> as I guess that's your last bullet yes. point there. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, as kind of the parallel or volumal direction is to do that. So, uh, if you have a nice Material, it's often nice to ask if there's some kind of hybrid artificial atom interesting system. Liquid helium is wonderfully impurity free, but there's a particularly nice impurity that it can have if you put it in there, which is an electron. So if you put an electron into liquid helium, it doesn't want to go up into that 20 electron volt conduction. Band. It can have a lower energy by localizing itself, paying the kinetic energy cost in that and pushing all the helium atoms away, paying the surface tension cost of making that bubble. And then it lives in a little bubble. And this is what electrons and helium do. And they have all kinds of interesting properties. They've been studied very thoroughly. Um, but one thing that's never really been measured is that the spin of that electron is supposed to be insanely pristine. 
there's just no relaxation mechanism around this. There are no nuclear, you know, there are no nuclei with uh, magnetic moments, none of that stuff around. So they're supposed to offer uh, an intriguing possibility for certain kinds of qubits. What the electron bubbles in this cavity, uh, what you might be able to do, so we have a proposal paper that's almost written, uh, is you can trap those electron bubbles, we think, in these acoustic modes. So it's trap it in an acoustic standing wave, the bubble wants to elicit a certain antinode. Then you can read out the bubble's motion with the optical light in the cavity. Watch this little one nanometer uh, void move around that detunes the cavity. So you can watch it move around. And then if there are the appropriate combination of magnetic fields and gradients, you can make its motion contingent on what the spin of that electron is, to read that out. And to date, nobody has been able to measure the spins of electrons either in bubbles or on the surface of the epithelium, uh, just for the lack of a good control and readout scheme. So we think this would be a really good way to do that. And I don't know that it will turn into the uh, you know, viable quantum computer by any means, but it would be a really interesting uh, kind of quantum impurity potential sensor for magnetic fields and things like that. So this was two kind of practical, reasonable seeming incremental uh, next steps, but that's one that we're also interested in pursuing this kind of uh, independent project. Any other questions? Any from uh, TV land? Okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay, very much.